When it comes to movies inspired by real-life events, biographical sports dramas tend to present a different kind of storytelling dilemma. That is, the most triumphant athletic achievements in the world tend to be documented contemporaneously from every exhaustive media angle imaginable. So in order to do justice to the authenticity of all involved, fudging facts and inventing details from whole cloth isn't a very wise idea. Not unless you want to alienate your audience and sap all of your credibility. No, on the contrary, with the all-time greatest true life sports films, laborious effort and painstaking detail are often made to ensure the utmost veracity of the athletes involved and the overall outcome of their competitive pursuits. Now, in the case of David O. Russell's awesome boxing biography, The Fighter, which chronicles the proud pugilistic prowess of Irish Mickey Ward, you might very well be surprised by how many liberties were taken with some of the micro and macro details in the film, while still honoring the overall legacy of the scrappy Lowell underdog and his embattled, drug-addicted half-brother, Dickie Eklund. To be clear, most of what transpires in the fighter genuinely occurred in the way it's depicted on screen, with incredible efforts made to recreate the precise in-ring action as it truly happened. However, in the interest of time and in order to increase the riveting dramatic stakes of Ward as a true underdog, O'Russell altered several details regarding fighters, win-loss records, weigh-ins, knockouts, and several other glaring and minute details that may have gone over casual fight fans' heads, yet have seriously called into question the movie's overall integrity. And that doesn't include the spate of out-of-ring changes that were made, mostly relating to Dickie's delusions and self-destructive dalliances. But enough of the foreplay. Y'all ready to go 12 rounds with this mu- Good. It's high time we find out what the f really happened to the fighter. First things first, the players. In the film, Mickey Ward is played by Mark Wahlberg, who also hails from a similar working class Massachusetts neighborhood. In fact, Wahlberg already knew Ward personally and, after making the biographical sports drama Invincible, actively elected to tell Ward's inspiring triumphs and tribulations on the big screen. Born six years apart, Ward and Wahlberg both stand at five foot eight, making him an ideal actor for the role. However, one of the most glaring differences between fact and fiction is that Mickey Ward is an orthodox fighter, yet Mark Wahlberg, who is left-handed, portrays Ward as a southpaw. Despite being 17 years apart, Christian Bale won an Oscar for playing Richard Dickey Eklund in the film, Mickey's crack-addicted half-brother with a heart of gold and brilliant fighting mind. Although Dickey is seven years older than Ward in the film, in reality, Wahlberg is three years older than Bale. The role of Mickey and Dickey's mother, Alice Eklund Ward, is played by Melissa Leo, who also won an Oscar for her role despite being roughly 30 years younger than her real-life counterpart. Although she played their mother, Leo was only 11 years older than Bale and 14 older than Wahlberg, respectively. Mickey's father, George Ward, is played by Jack McGee with astonishing likeness. As for Mickey's girlfriend come wife, Charlene Fleming Ward, she's portrayed by Amy Adams in the film, who is two years younger in reality. One of O'Russell's first orders of cinematic realism included casting Mickey O'Keefe as himself, a real-life police officer from Lowell, Massachusetts, who moonlighted as Ward's boxing trainer. O'Keefe, who opened the Lowell Boxing Club as a way to keep troubled kids off the street, and harness their rage in a more positive manner, initially balked at the role having never acted before, but Wahlberg encouraged him to do so on the basis of the foresight and quick thinking required to be a good cop. O'Keefe eventually agreed and holds his own quite well in the film and adds an undeniable authenticity to the story. Several other people involved in the film were played by themselves, from trainer Art Romalho to the famous boxing legend Sugar Ray Leonard as well as famed HBO announcers Jim Lampley, Larry Merchant, Roy Jones Jr., and others. All of this was a part of O'Russell's vision to recapture the gritty verisimilitude of Ward's glorious feats in the ring and disgraceful defeats outside of it. For his part, 
Wahlberg trained extensively and even built a gym in his house, in which the Ward brothers lived for a time during pre-production and made sure that Mickey was on set throughout the shoot to mimic his maneuvering. Even some minor characters have connections to their real-life counterparts. For example, the young man in the film who warns the family that Dickie is being abused by the cops is played by Sean Eklund, the nephew of the real Mickey and Dickie. Similarly, the police officer who makes a prank arrest of Dickie at the end of the film is played by Eric Wayne, whose father, Gerald Wayne, was the real officer who often arrested Dickie following his sordid transgressions. Now, onto the veracity of the diegetic details. The film opens with the prospect of Dickie being the subject of a 1995 HBO documentary. Am I looking, is this, am I looking right in the camera here? Right here. All right. Entitled High on Crack Street, Lost Lives in Lowell. This, sadly, was truly the case with Dickie really believing that the documentary was about his big, redemptive boxing comeback rather than a sobering account of the crack epidemic in America. According to Russell during a Charlie Rose interview, if he had stopped being a crackhead, it would have stopped being that movie. He could have made it a positive thing, and so they partly fooled him, but he also made his own bed. In order to recreate the specific time and place of Lowell in the mid-90s, Russell opted to film in the real Massachusetts location, using Art Romalho's West End Gym as a key location, the place Ward genuinely trained at during his formative years. Moreover, Russell elected to shoot the faux documentary footage within the film using the same HBO beta cameras from the time period. Russell even cast the real director of High on Crack Street, Richard Farrell, to virtually play himself in the film as one of the HBO cameramen. While filming the documentary, Dickie, who asked to have his name spelled as Dickie in the film to mirror his brother Mickey, proudly boasts about the time he knocked down Sugar Ray Leonard during his career. While this is not ascertained in the movie, Dickie never knocked Leonard down during their 1978 clash. In reality, the two fighters got tangled in the ninth round, resulting in Dickie stepping on Leonard's foot and forcing him to trip. On the contrary, despite going the distance, Leonard knocked Dickie down twice in their bout and won by unanimous decision. According to Dickie, years after the fight, no, I didn't knock him down. That was bullshit. He slipped. The next major event in the film depicts Ward fighting on an Atlantic City undercard against Mike Machine Gun Mungan a substitute fighter billed as 20 pounds heavier than Mickey. Straight up, several details about the fight as seen in the film are completely false or fabricated to increase the dramatic effect. For instance, going into the fight, the film claims Ward is on a current four-fight losing streak. In reality, Ward was 18-1 and, and won four straight matches heading into the Mungan fight in 1988. Ward's four consecutive losses didn't come until 1990 to 1991. Far more egregious, the film dramatically over-exaggerates the weight difference between fighters to make it appear as if Ward is the overpowered David to Mungan's powerful Goliath. Hogwash. Look at the size of that guy. Holy shit. Yeah, holy shit. In reality, Ward entered the ring weighing in at 136.5 pounds, while Mungan clocked in at 145 pounds. The truth is, Ward was only 8.5 pounds lighter than Mungan, a substantial figure nonetheless, but nowhere near as impressive as the film makes the feat out to be. Further fudging the facts in order to make Ward look feebler and grossly overmatched, the movie depicts Ward getting absolutely thrashed by Mungan as a result of the weight disparity. In reality, the fight was a hotly contested bout that went the full 10 rounds, with Mungan very narrowly winning by a decision. The final scorecard for the real Ward Mungan bout was 96 to 93, 95 to 94, and 95 to 94, respectively. The truest part of the fight was the last minute substitution of Mungan for Soal Mumbi, a boxer in Ward's weight class who fell ill prior to the match. With too much money on the line, promoter Ron Katz arranged for Mungan to take Mambi's place 
at the Zero Hour. Just before Ward is defeated by Mungan in the film, he meets his future wife, Charlene Fleming, in a local pub in Lowell where she works as a barback. However, their meeting did not occur this way in reality. Ward actually met Charlene roughly a decade after the Mungan bout, around the time he fought Shay Neary in March of 2000, the final fight portrayed in the movie. Despite being integral to his in-ring success during the film, Ward went on to praise Charlene's contributions to his success, telling the Vancouver Sun, if it wasn't for her, Charlene, and Mickey, O'Keefe, I probably wouldn't be here. I know I wouldn't be here. In terms of the film suggesting that Charlene was a distraction that caused Mickey's career to crash after the Mungan fight, this was entirely made up to drive the dramatic narrative. The truth is, Mickey and Charlene didn't meet until 10 years later. Charlene's depiction as a former star athlete in the film was completely true. As she rose to prominence in track and field as a Lowell Sun all-star high jumper in the 1990s, Charlene is seen performing high jumps in the movie with Mickey's daughter, Cassie, Caitlin Dwyer, who is indeed the name of Mickey's real-life daughter. Another aspect of the film that bears scrutiny is Mickey's large family, consisting of his seven disapproving sisters. Well, while Mickey really does have that many siblings, the real-life counterparts have voiced disdain over their on-screen depiction. According to actress Bianca Hunter, who plays Mickey's half-sister Kathy Pork Eklund in the film, the real Pork was on set during filming, and voiced her displeasure with Hunter's portrayal to her face. Likewise, the real Phyllis Beaver Eklund, played by Conan O'Brien's sister, Kate O'Brien, walked out of the theater during the preview screening. Moreover, the real Charlene Fleming was not a fan of Adams' portrayal, taking serious umbrage with the scantily clad, low-cut shorts and revealing blouses the character wears in the film. According to Adams, during a premiere event, she, Charlene, was very concerned about the lack of clothes that her character wore. Unfortunately, the real Dickie Eklund was also disappointed in the way he and his family were portrayed in the film, despite Bale earning an Oscar for his soulful performance. According to Men's Journal, Eklund publicly berated Bale in a fit of rage following a Paramount screening for the film for the way Dickie treats his mother and sisters in the movie. However, Eklund came around to praise Bale's performance Despite telling Fox 25, Mickey looks like a million bucks, and I look like a $2 bill. According to an interview he gave with George Lopez following the film's release, the real Dickie Eklund also took minor issue with the scene in which his character jumps out of a crack house window to evade the police, landing on a garbage dumpster to break his fall below. Eklund claims that, in reality, he'd often plunge from much higher up and never had a dumpster to pad the pain. That base head strength is no joke. However, the whole storyline in the film involving Dickie's prostitution scam really did happen in the 1980s. Dickie would often work in tandem with his girlfriend, claiming she was a prostitute, then arrest her Johns as a phony undercover police officer while pocketing the money for himself. In fact, shit got much darker and more violent in reality. According to the biography Irish Thunder by Bob Holloran, Dickie would often hide in the closet and wait for the doped up Johns to arrive before scaring them to death with a shotgun and stealing their cash. The one difference is Dickie's arrest, which did not occur the way it's shown on screen. Rather than being rolled up on by the cops mid-scam, a victim went to the cops after the fact. Upon arrest, Dickie hid in his sister's closet until she gave him up to the authorities. Not to get too far into the legal weeds and kick a man while he's down, but Dickie truly did receive jail time as seen on screen, at which point Mickey began training with Sal Lanano, played by the soprano scribe Frank Renzulli, with the surname slightly changed to Lanano. Lanano was a former taxicab proprietor, and while Dickie worked hard to rehabilitate his image and retrain as a fighter from his prison cell, he ultimately returned to train with Mickey for his most glorious moments. When the HBO documentary aired, it came as a shocking expose on the crack cocaine epidemic. Dickie indeed felt betrayed and ashamed for his unwitting participation, a depressing reality shown in the film. Unfortunately, 
After spending four years sober in prison and roughly another five post-release, Dickey relapsed and was arrested on crack cocaine possession charges in July 2006. But back to the boxing. Once Mickey builds himself up with the help of his new team following the Mungin drubbing, he begins to take a series of fights to steal him for the epic showdown with Shay Neri at the end of the film. During Mickey's fierce rank-climbing montage, several of his opponents are named, including fighters Minetti, Collins, and Hernandez. In truth, Mickey Ward never fought anyone by these names in his career. All Falderall! Moreover, just before scoring the Neary bout, Ward is depicted facing an up-and-comer named Alfonso Sanchez, played by Miguel Espino. The movie makes it seem like Ward's defeat of Sanchez is the sole reason for securing the Neary fight. This is more brazen balderdash. In reality, Ward defeated Sanchez on April 4th, 1997, nearly three whole years before he faced Neary on March 11th, 2000. What's more, Ward had six fights in between his clash with Sanchez and Neary, scoring a 4-2 win-loss record in the process. A hilarious anachronism takes place in the film when Mickey walks out to the entrance song The Warrior's Code by Boston punk band Dropkick Murphys, a song that wasn't released until 2005. All of this was brushed over in the film, likely in the interest of time, but for genuine boxing diehards who measured the sweet science by the most granular metrics, the discrepancy between fact and fiction here has caused a lot of fans to call bullshit in a resounding fashion. For casual and non-fight fans, the imperceptible alterations neither make nor break the overall experience. That the film is still a rousing crowd-pleaser is a testament to Russell and his A-list acting troupe. The next big bout in the film takes place during the iconic finale, in which Ward takes on Shay, the Shamrock Express, Neary, in London. Save for the overseas locale, several factual inaccuracies about the fight are conveyed in the film, likely as a way to increase the tension, suspense, and overall stakes of the bout. Heading into the fight with Neary, Mickey's record is shown to be 30-7 with 20 knockouts. In reality, his record was 34-9 with 25 KOs heading into his bout with Neary. The missing nine fights were likely subtracted from the truncated version of Ward's mid-career. Additionally, likely to accommodate Wahlberg's real weight at the time, Ward and Neary are introduced as weighing 146 pounds apiece. However, in reality, Ward weighed 140 pounds to Neary's 139 pounds. In the film, Alice Ward is shown cheering her son ringside along Charlene. However, this was confabulated for the film as Alice was not in attendance for the real Ward Neary match. But one of the biggest instances of dramatic license taken in the film includes Ward being knocked down by Neary in the sixth round of their bout, prompting a motivational speech from Dickie and Charlene alike. The truth is, Ward was never knocked down by Neary in their match. During the fight in the film, Ward is almost pitied for being far behind on the scorecards, necessitating a furious comeback in order to emerge victoriously. In truth, legendary boxing ring judge Howard Lederman had Neary ahead on the cards by a razor-thin 67-66 margin heading into the eighth round. But the absolute coup de Gracie, in a sly semantical celebration, the announcers in the film claim that Ward and Neary are battling for the world title. For the WBU Welterweight Championship of the World! This is more flat out poppycock. While their match was indeed for the World Boxing Union Light Welterweight title, no serious fight fan in history or ever considered the WBO title as a legitimate world champion. Russell and company grossly juiced the importance of Ward's victory over Neary in terms of professional rankings to make him seem even more triumphant. It's certainly understandable for storytelling purposes, but does not align with the facts. Okay, so now that we know the micro and macro differences between reality and events in The Fighter, it's worth recounting the riveting methods Russell used to accurately recreate the in-ring boxing action. The first thing Russell sought to achieve is simulating the visual aesthetic of HBO's cameras in the 1990s. The big boxing bouts were filmed at the Sangha Center at UMass Lowell, with over 200 dummies used to fill the arena seating in the final bout between Ward and Neary. According to Russell, 
the visceral boxing footage was achieved in big choreographed sections that were taken directly from video of Mickey's actual fights as a means of a shot-for-shot -shot simulacrum, adding, we use the actual commentary from Larry Merchant, Roy Jones Jr., and Jim Lampley. Going further, a cool factoid about the HBO commentary used during the Ward Neary fight in the film includes Jim Lampley's lines, Imagine if you bought a ticket! These lines were actually lifted from Lampley's commentary for the ninth round of Mickey Ward's first of three legendary fights with Arturo Gotti on May 18, 2002, and the only one that Ward won, and repurposed for the Ward Neary clash. Just imagine if you bought a ticket! Speaking of the iconic Ward Gotti trilogy, it is said to be the subject of the long guest stating Fighter 2, which has been in development for roughly a decade. In 2013, Entourage's Jerry Ferreira was slated to play Gotti. In 2015, producer Todd Lieberman publicly encouraged fans by claiming the sequel was far from dead. As of early 2022, the film is still in production purgatory. However, Wahlberg recently turned 50, and despite the excellent shape he's dedicated to staying in, the window may have passed to play Irish Mickey Ward once more. Hell, who knows, there's always a fighting chance. As for the real Mickey Ward, he indeed married Charlene in 2005, as stated at the end of the film. They still reside in Lowell to this day, where Mickey owns a boxing gym called Mickey's Corner. By all accounts, Mickey and Dickie also remain close. The heartfelt interviews of Mickey and Dickie that bookend the movie were not based on reality. They were improvised on the spot by Wahlberg and Bale, with only Russell on set to direct them. And that, dear friends, is really what the happened to the fighter. While several major and minor factoids and tidbits have been altered to beef up the dramatic impact of the story, the overarching spirit and series of events largely remain faithful to what truly transpired in the life of Mickey and Dickie during the highs and lows of their personal and professional lives. No less inspiring, sometimes a film needs to bend the truth a tad to underscore the salience of the story. In the case of The Fighter, no one could bend Mickey Ward or the entire cast and crew's will to be great.